Now you probably noticed at this point that I made a few color adjustments to my scene. And the way I did this is using a very useful tool in Photoshop known as an adjustment layer. So if I go back into the brush tool and I'll grab my default brush here and I'll soften it up a bit. If I want to make a very subtle and uh, subtle color adjustment to an object or to an area of my scene, instead of going into my color adjustment and playing with the saturation, let's say all of this is flattened here, okay, instead of just saturating the whole thing globally and and doing it directly on the object, all you need to do is use an adjustment layer. And one of the ones I use very often when it comes to color is color balance. Okay, And what color balance does is it allows you to add colors maybe a bit of red, maybe a bit of cyan, okay, maybe a bit of green, to whatever it is I want to color, but I'm doing it on a separate layer. So I, if I don't like it, I can always just get rid of it, right? However, if you notice here, what I've done is I've applied that color adjustment to everything south of, everything below my color adjustment layer. So to if I wanted to connect it just to this tree, then all I have to do is click on Alt and connect it to the tree. That's all I got to do. Now another thing you can do to go even further with it is maybe you only want to apply that particular color adjustment to certain areas. Maybe I just want to add a bit of green here and add a bit of red there. So to do that, a color, whenever you create a new color adjustment by default it creates a mask layer. With a mask layer, much like we learned when we were working with this texture brush, is any area that's black, well sorry actually it's opposite, any area that's black on a mask is is transparency. Any area that's white is going to be considered opacity. So for instance I take a brush and I paint black over this area, I'm actually going to be deleting some of this mask. Okay. If I, for instance, hit X, because we have black and white, is black is my foreground and white is my background layer, if I hit X I reverse those. Now white is my foreground layer, my foreground color that is. If I put white then I can apply that color. Okay, and it's basically that. And if I want to add another area that has a different color adjustment to it, maybe this one's red. I'm going to connect it just like I did the other one. You can do a series of connected layers. Just keep doing that. A, a quick shortcut for doing that is just to drag it between your main layer and your adjust your original adjustment layer. Oops, my bad. Just like that, and it'll immediately connect in sequence. And on this one, I want to add some red. So again, I'll mask out the areas I don't need. With, with black, like that, and I'll add the areas I want using white, just like that. And that's how you make the color adjustments. Just remember that when you're doing a color adjustment you have to work, you generally like to work subtly, gently. It's just making tiny little little tweaks. In this case I actually used far more, far stronger color adjustments just to illustrate my idea, but generally I work very very gently with them. Now, in the last section, I talked about how you can actually put yourself into the headspace of another artist. However, you can take that a step further, several steps further. And one of the things I, I've learned is a very valuable, uh, a very valuable learning tool and a very valuable creative tool as an artist is to put yourself in the headspace of other professions, be it hairdressing, be it shoemaking, be it sculpting, be it landscape art, be it architecture, whatever. Okay, the world's your oyster. However, one of the reasons why this is such a powerful tool is because it, every single profession out there, or most professions out there, have as much history and depth as art itself. Shoemaking has been around for centuries, and there's a great deal of history and knowledge to be learned from this profession. And a perfect example of how, uh, uh, a perfect example of, of some of the discoveries I made through other professions is a good friend in my family's is a hairdresser, a professional hairdresser. And one day she was cutting my daughter's hair, and I was sitting down, I was just watching her do it, and out of curiosity, because we had time to kill, I asked her what goes in, what type of stuff did you have to, have to study as a hairdresser? And this was of course coming from a completely ignorant layman's perspective. I had no clue. 
Okay, no clue what goes into being a hairdresser. She didn't answer me. She just smirked and went into her closet and pulled out this book that was about two by two feet. The thing weighed about 16 tons and she dropped it on my knees. Almost killed me, okay? And she said, well, there's a good starting point. And of course, I looked at her with that look of, if you think I'm going to read this, you're dreaming in Technicolor. So of course, she laughed and, you know, and she started to explain a few things to me. And I was completely humbled at the knowledge that had to go into being a hairdressing, your knowledge of anatomy. And I'm not talking about facial anatomy. I'm talking about anatomy from head to toe, biology, chemistry, and the list goes on. It was huge. Well, hence the huge book that was sitting on my lap, right? And that's just one approach to hairdressing. But how? one of the things that, that really struck me was how it connected so closely to the art of character design, for instance, because hairdressers have a way of categorizing different anatomies to create aesthetic balance with a person depending on the type of anatomy they have. So they've actually had ways of categorizing different head types like pear-shaped or diamond-shaped or round or whatever the case might be or square and they have different ways of categorizing profiles like concave, convex, normal and so on and so forth and furthermore different body types shorter, fatter, square, broader shoulders, longer neck, shorter neck, the whole bit. They've actually categorized it in ways that artists very often don't you don't categorize these things in your head, you just do it by intuition. You do it through observation. This person looks this way, I'm going to draw them. This person looks this way, I'm going to draw them like that. It's purely through observation. And generally you use a certain body type to portray a certain character and a different type of body type to portray another character. This realization through hairdressing opened my mind up to hundreds of other possibilities and helped me go when I walked outside after my daughter's hair was cut and I walked outside, I immediately started to look at different people and say, ah, this type of body type, and that type of body, and this type of profile, and this type of head shape, and these types of shoulders. And I could, all of a, all of a sudden, these ideas started to come out. Furthermore, if I wanted to create something that was aesthetically balanced in a drawing where I was creating a character, I had that knowledge as well, because I realized, oh, if I add volume to hair here and remove volume there, or if I have the hair tuck in in this certain way, it actually balances better with this type of body type, which is something I never would have thought of either. I would have just drawn in the hair, intuitively with my knowledge of how to draw hair, right? Now in this particular case, if we put it in the context of this painting, at the point that I had reached where we are right now, I had actually, I, I left, I went, to my, I went to my mother's house, and my mother's house is literally a museum, she's got everything there. And on her windowsill, she has an old sculpture that she's had for about 10 years that I always loved, it was this little Chinese shoemaker, it stood about a foot tall. And what I always loved about sculpting was the fact that it was almost as if you freeze-framed a moment in time that you liked, you turned it into stone, cut it out of the earth, shrunk it down into a portable size, and stuck it on a table. It was like freeze-framing a moment in time and, and sticking it on your table. And I loved that concept. And as soon as I projected those thoughts into painting, I imagined for a moment, what if all of this blue, what if all of this negative space, this unpainted area, what if that was anywhere? What if this was actually a sculpture we were looking at, a sculpture of a tree that could be placed anywhere? What if it was a tiny tree sitting on a windowsill? Or what if it was a huge tree sitting on, on a shoe? It could be anywhere. I could have it in a sewer, in the desert, whatever. And I actually played around with these different ideas when I came back home because I was so excited to continue working on it. I tried about three or four different ideas just to see how it looked. Now, that's not necessarily what I ended up with. I don't want to spoil it for you, okay? But it opened up my imagination to possibilities that I never would have considered if I was just looking at this artistically. I had to step out of my own area of profession. Imagine what kind of ideas I could have come up with if I thought of this in terms of a plumber, right? About plumbing and internal plumbing in a house. Just imagine the ideas I could come up with that, okay? Who better to talk to than a plumber or go online and look up, you know, a beginner's guide to plumbing or electrician or something like that, or, or architecture. You'd be amazed how many ideas you can come up with that can spark your imagination and furthermore, help you grow amazingly as an artist. So these are things that I absolutely encourage everybody to do. So what's stopping you? Go for it. Right, now in this part of the tutorial we're going to start bringing in a little bit of mood lighting okay 
In earlier tutorials like the Voodoo Doll tutorial, if you haven't seen it, I'll have the link on the bottom of the page so you can go have a look. It's free. It's, it covers a lot of the physics of lighting and how lighting works and stuff like that. Um, definitely go and have a look at it. In today's tutorial, we're, at, we're actually going to be approaching lighting from more of a set designer's perspective, a cinematographer's. How would, a, how would a, a cinematographer, for instance, set up the lights in a stage set, an interior stage set, so that all the information is there, so that they've established the right mood, so we get the right setting. Let's say it's an exterior urban setting. Is it a sunset? Is it the sunrise? Is it uh, looking through is the light coming through a window? You have to give off that illusion with lighting. It's a very powerful tool used in cinematography. And essentially, when we first walk into a stage set, what we see is this. And it's exactly the same thing we see in 3D. 3D, and 3D is based on live action film. It's based on cinematography rules. It's the same thing. The same way you'd set up, you'd set up the lighting for, a, state, for a, a stage set is the same way you'd set up lighting for a 3D scene that you've modeled yourself. Okay? And it's those same rules that we're going to apply here. We're not going to use all of them, but I want to give you a brief overview of them so you can play around with them at your leisure however which way you want. You can implement all of them, or one of them, or two of them, however you see fit. Okay? When we first look at a stage set, this is what we see. Not much. Generally speaking, both in cinematography and in 3D, there is a thing called a, an area light. And an area light is just kind of a light bulb that lights up the set just a touch. Not enough to have too much influence on the scene, but enough so that we're not, walk, we're not bumping into walls. That's essentially it, okay? It's bringing up just a little bit of that information. The main source of light, or the key light, is the light that establishes our main figure. Okay, our main character. In this case, I'm imagining that the sunlight is coming through uh, a glass door inside somebody's house. Let's just imagine, let's just hypothetically speaking, okay? A warm light coming in th through the doorway. Somebody's standing at the door, answering the door, and there's somebody on the opposite side. Now, we have this information. We're starting to see what's going on here, but we're losing a lot of what's going on here, right? That's where a fill light comes in. And a fill light is generally uh, not as powerful Okay, we're going to tone it down. It's not as powerful as the key light because we don't want people to think this is the source, of, main source of light. We want people to f know that this one is. So we'll bring it down to about 50% of the main key light. So the key light and the fill light. Then you have what we're going to be working on today is the rim light. And the rim light is a light that's placed usually directly behind the character or slightly off to the, to the side but placed opposite the camera just to capture a very a tiny little rim around the edge and basically what that serves to do is make that character pop from the background it helps enhance that sense of depth you can see without it and with it now we can really feel it him jump ahead okay after that we have to know what's going on in the set right what's going on in the rest of the scene there's decorations there's all kinds of things going on so what we what, that's where the background light comes in that will light the background Maybe we might have a fireplace and, you know, romantic dinner, some chocolates, Barbara Streisand music playing in the background, you know, you know, typical stuff. And finally, the only other, the, 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 the last type of lighting uh, um, that you can bring into a set actually doesn't influence the scene at all. It doesn't light any of the characters, if at all, very, very minimally, but it's there to establish mood, and that's called a set light, like a candle, for instance, if we were to bring in the line work, okay? A set light doesn't influence anything, it's just a light little decorative things that you throw into the scene. Maybe it's a window, maybe it's a, you know, a, a Christmas tree ornaments or something like that, like lights on a Christmas tree. Those are called set lights. But that's the basic light setting. But the only thing we're going to be worrying about today is this bad boy over here, the rim lighting, okay? Now in terms of how I applied that to the painting, well, I had my main layer, my painting layer, I masked it and then I painted it in just like that. My brush is set to shape dynamics turned off. Okay, paint in the lighting. Oops, uh. paint in the lighting and then erase. And if I have rounded shapes, for instance, I want a hard edge versus a soft edge. Then I paint it in with a hard edge and then I come in and I put a soft edge next to it. And they just work like that. And the lighting is coming from the bottom. It's coming from behind us, behind the set. And you're going to see, I'm going to ha actually have an arrow in my scene to show the, where the exact light direction is coming from.
Now, one of the things I'd like to discuss at this point is a, not necessarily a controversial topic, but it's a topic that has opposing views. A different, different people have different ways of going about it, and that really has to do with your own personal personality and where you find growth artistically and professionally. This is a conversation starter. This is I'm opening up a perspective to you so you can explore it yourself. Okay. It is, however, not the be all end all of anything. Nothing that I've said is the be all end all. Everybody has their own way of perceiving the world and their own way of finding growth and inspiration and productivity and success. The reason I'm saying it this way is because the opposite opinion that I've very often heard, I've heard through artists that I look up to, admire, and have learned a great deal from. Okay. However, you got to find where you fit into this niche and perhaps even propose your own contribution to this conversation as well, a different perspective that, that you haven't heard and that I haven't necessarily proposed in this segment either. Okay, And that's the whole subject of goal setting. And what I mean by that is, let's say, for instance, say to tell yourself, okay, in five years, I'm going to have this job, I'm going to be this good, I'm going to have this much money, drive this car, live in this house, have this girlfriend, uh, have this many pets, and be a father of this many kids. Goal setting. Through the course of my career, I've approached life and my career through both headspaces. I've tried goal setting, and I've tried not goal setting, okay, and just live it day by day. And what I've actually experienced in my life is that, for me, for Adam, goal setting actually worked against me in terms of productivity. And the reason for this being is it put the pressure of time on everything that I was doing. If I didn't reach this goal by a certain date, if I didn't meet this criteria within this period of time, I, to a certain degree, failed. Okay. Now, of course, I'm being a bit dramatic and pessimistic, but it's, it is there. Those feelings do linger when you put yourself into that headspace. And you've got to remember something. And this is something I remind myself all the time as well. Time is, is made by... It, time is man-made. Okay? It's a creation of humankind. It doesn't exist in nature the way, the way we interpret it. We've just found a way of organizing time based on based on the solar system, based on sunrises and sunsets, based on seasons, okay? But time is man-made, essentially. And if you constantly put the pressure of time on you, it keeps you in a state of stress, or it can, depending on your personality, right? And I found that in my career, the moment I abandoned the element of time, I found that it gave me the right freedom of mind to be able to achieve all of those things that I needed to achieve in order to grow artistically. Okay, I needed to be able to achieve these things in order to grow artistically. For instance, I need to have the patience to be able to sit down and stare at a tuft of grass for 20 minutes and study the lighting and the texture and the way it moves, so to speak. I have to have patience in my own work in order to explore and learn and grow. Okay, And it's that knowledge that I gain, that I can apply to this quote-unquote library of visual information I have in my brain in order to create artwork on my own without any visual reference. But as soon as I said, forget the goals, why don't I just experience and enjoy every day, every moment of what I'm doing, that it took the stress of time off of my shoulders, put me in a more peaceful headspace, and in essence, a more productive headspace. I allowed myself to enjoy every moment of my art and the growth of it, rather than sitting there and saying, I have to reach this goal by this time. Come on, move, move, move. By doing that for me, I found that it actually took the enjoyment of art out of art itself. And this is something that I encourage you to discuss and explore on your own terms as well. All right, at this point, we're actually going to throw a character into this scene, okay? And one of, the, one of the reasons why I most often integrate a character into an illustration, um, an illustration as opposed to a, um, an environment design. In an environment design, it's not always important to have a character because the environment is what's important. Um, it's important to put a character because that's what, your, that's what your audience is going to identify with. And people will interpret your piece through the character that you put into your painting. In this particular case, I decided I put, wanted to put a young child. Uh, in my case, I put a young girl because I'm surrounded by little girls all the time, so it's where my head is. 
But um, I put it into the space of a little girl because, uh, or a little child, a young child, because it's a, for a child when you put when you project your own feelings onto a child, it's a moment of discovery. Where if I had somebody who is you know 45 wearing a backpack, you'd think they probably see stuff like this all the time. That's the first reason, and the second reason was because um, because of the scale difference. I wanted to f I wanted us to feel the 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 size, the enormous size of this tree. By putting somebody large, a tall person next to it, it could kill some of that size. So I wanted that nice scale difference to show off the size of the tree, to create a little bit more of a fantastical feel to it. So that being said, I just want to give you a quick run through of how I approached the sketch of this character. Now I set my brush exactly the way I did for my initial sketch. Okay. And this one is being approached a little bit more technically. Okay. However, it's cartoony. I already have my knowledge of anatomy, basic anatomy, but I'm making this a simple drawing of a girl. However, the girl is facing away from us, so I'm not going to have to worry about any of the facial details or any of, I'm not going to have to worry about knuckles and all of those fine details of the hands because she's very distant. It's not going to be necessary because nobody's even going to see it. And we're not, she's facing away from us. So we don't have to worry about, um, about her facial details, which would take longer to draw, but who cares, right? But in any case, this is a technical drawing. This Generally, when I'm doing humans, I'm not going to go straight ahead with a human because um, I want this to be believable. I want the forms to be believable. So I'm basically going to worry about the geometric form. So I have the shape of the head. I have the shape of the torso. Let's say I did a stretched cylinder for the torso, something like that. Okay, I'm taking into consideration that I have child proportions. Okay, so let's say this would represent the rib cage. I could also approach the rib cage with a sphere to indicate the rib cage. I really wanted to get anatomical with it. However, sometimes being too anatomical can actually kill the drawing. Okay, I don't necessarily want to approach it like that. I'm just going to use basic shapes like that, and I just want to block in. The shape of her body. Okay, so let's say this would be her rib cage. Then she'd have her hips, which I can might make another cylinder like that. I'm going to have my center line to find the flow of movement. Okay, I can transform this down to make it smaller. Move it up a bit, and then I'm going to have cylinders for her legs probably. Okay, and I'm taking into into account the fact that she's facing away from us. Okay. And she might have one leg up because she's walking. So we're going to have one cylinder here, and then this cylinder is going to come towards us because she's got a leg bent, foreshortening. And then I'm going to have a shape for the legs. And I'm thinking all of this in terms of geometric shapes, simple geometric shapes. Uh, she's a child. Children generally have larger heads in proportion to their body. There, now she looks a bit younger. Okay. I'm going to have cylinders for her arms and legs. Right. And I'm taking into account as well simple uh, proportion rule, rules to proportion. For instance, elbows that line up with the bottom of the rib cage. The rib cage, which is about one and a half times the head down. Now, these proportions aren't perfect because I'm drawing it perfect, but generally I would go, okay, this is the size of the head, and then I'm going to go one and a half heads down, right? Like that. This arm might be bent because she's swinging her arms. So I'm going to have one cylinder that's like this and the other cylinder that's facing away like that. And I'm creating my character that's walking. And it, the same way I did with the tree, I can very easily take certain parts of the body and I can scale them. Let's say I found the hips are a little bit too narrow for a little girl. I can transform it. Maybe I want to add a bit of a tilt to the head to add a little bit more character. I can move the pivot here and rotate it a little bit to add a little bit more movement to the character's expression. And then I can worry about adding in little details like the shoulders. Um, she's looking from the back. I can have the crease of her butt like that. I can have a little bit of an indication of maybe some hips. But I'm not going to get over... I'm not, I just want to get the basic shapes because I'm going to be throwing clothes over this. But you'll notice one of the important things that I'm doing here is I'm... Um, drawing the anatomy of the body before I throw the clothes up on top of that. Oh yeah, it's behind her, so the neck is going to travel behind, like that. I'm going to have the ears, like that. 
And then once I have all of these things, once I have all these elements in place, then I can paint the clothes on top of it. Maybe I need a little bit indicate her her the back of her of her shoulders, her shoulder blades, like that. And I also want to make sure that her weight is properly distributed. Okay. And one of the quick tricks you can do for for establishing balance and weight in a pose is that you want the head to be over the foot. Okay. You'll notice that right now, if I draw a straight line, her center, of, her head is actually he, is over this spot. So her center of gravity is a little bit too over to this side. So I can just do a transform and tilt it over so that the head is lined up over the foot. Her center of gravity is between these two spots like that. And that's a very quick trick for establishing weight in a pose. If you find that like, your character is tipping over a little bit, it doesn't feel quite right, then just look for the, the placement of the head and the feet. If, for instance, she's on both feet, here, let's just straighten this foot for the sake of argument. If she's on both feet, if both feet are on the ground, she's just standing, for instance, okay? Let's say she's on both feet. Her center of, right now, I'm suggesting that even though both of her feet are on the ground, her weight is leaning on this foot because her head is above this foot. But if I want to show that her weight is distributed equally on both feet, I'm going to select this area like that, move it over, and then I'll take these feet and I'll do a little quick trick with my transform tool. I'm going to do control T, but then I'm going to hold down the control so I can skew it. See, I can move it around like this anywhere I want. Now I'm actually skewing the weight over onto both feet. I can even go further with it here. Like this. Now because her head is over, if I actually draw a line straight down, her head is here, I'm suggesting that her weight is equally distributed on both feet. Okay? Just like that. Now her weight is distributed on both. And that's very important for credibility. Once that's done, once I've got the pose and I've worked it out the way I want it to, once that's done, then I can start dressing her. Okay, and in this case, I had her like she had a little, she's going to have a little hoodie like this. I'm going to throw in some creases for where the sleeves are, like that. A little fold in her arm where her arm is bent. Maybe it might be tighter on this side because her arm is pulling and it's tightening the fabric on this side of the arm. And it's going to be a few more folds here like this and then it's going to come down like that it might go below her 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 butt if i have boots and her pants are tucked into her boots then i'm going to draw the boots first like this and then i'm going to paint in the pants where they tuck into the boots see suggest so that it's folding it's kind of pushing up and folding a little bit and then once that's done, I can draw the hair on the back of her head, give her little pigtails like this. And I might give a little, if her head was tilted, you're going to see in the actual drawing, her head is slightly, she's looking up this way instead. In this case, she might be looking down a little bit. Then I would show the outer contour, the very outer contour of her cheek like that. Maybe the slight touch of a nose there, but maybe not. And we're looking behind the ear, so we're going to actually look at the ear from behind. So if I'm drawing her hair, like that, I'm just showing the side of the face just slightly to show that her head is slightly tilted this way. And then her little neck comes like this, and so on and so forth. Okay? And that's essentially how I'm going to draw it. And then, as far as blocking, color, all of that stuff, exactly the same way that I approached every other part of the drawing. And there's even a little, I, I don't necessarily turn shape dynamics on. I might do the shading with a, with my shape dynamics turned off the same way I did with the Voodoo Doll tutorial that you can find on YouTube. All right. So that being said, that's how I approach the character. It's a little bit more of a technical approach. However, when I'm doing clothes, I'm thinking in maybe a little bit straight ahead where I'm kind of just letting my my hand 
go along and find little bumps and nooks and crannies to create a little bit of an organic feel to it. But essentially, this is a technical drawing, as opposed to the tree that just went off in crazy directions. Now at this point in the painting, as you'll notice when I start doing the blocking, I'm going to choose very generic yellow colors for the raincoat and the rain boots because I was thinking I wanted people to identify uh, that this was a raincoat and rain boots. However, it was around that point that my 10-year-old uh, my daughter walked in the room and said, oh, that looks just like Chloe. And of course, that was no coincidence because I knew I wanted to have a young child in this painting for specific reasons. However, you know, she's my daughter and I wanted to, you know, do a little shout out for my two-year-old. So there you go. Your problem. Anyways, that being said, um, she also went on to say, well, Chloe has a red raincoat with white polka dots. And I thought, yeah, that's true. And I, you know, I interpreted that as at first as uh, that she probably thought I was literally doing Chloe. But that wasn't really my intention at the beginning. However, when she walked away, when she left, I, I thought about it for a couple of minutes and I thought, you know, actually there is something to be said about that. Because generally when you're working on a character design, one of the most important elements of a character design is their face, is their facial features, their expression, how they react and respond to the environment. However, I didn't have that liberty because I was looking at this, um, we were looking at this character from behind, so we don't have the face to identify with. I had to find some other means for my audience to identify with her as a character, as a, as a person. And a very important element of character design is fashion design as well, because the choice of clothing tells us a lot about that person's personality, where they're from, where their preferences are. And by creating a preference in her clothing, by suggesting that she actually picked these clothes, these are her favorite colors, so to speak, I'm creating a sense of identity with our character, which is important. Now, aesthetically speaking, that might not have worked with the painting as a whole. It might have clashed if I picked these specific colors. However, when I thought in terms of um, the overall piece, I used a very complementary color scheme, different variations of red and green. So the red works. That's, that work, that's the first thing that works. The second thing is I wanted to create a strong visual. I wanted her to be the first thing that people saw. I wanted her to be the main focal point. In order to do that, I just decided to go with a deeper, stronger saturation of red. And with the white polka dots, I'm creating a strong contrast. And then again, that's even further enhanced with the slightly stronger specular highlights caused by the plastic surface of her coat. Okay, So the focal point is established, it, it complements the rest of the piece, and it creates a sen sense of identity. Awesome. Now, why did I want her to be the center of attention? Well, because I know both from experience and learning from other artists that when you put a human or living character into your scene, your audience is going to identify with that first. They are going to interpret the rest of the environment through the eyes or through the mind or through the representation of that character. I wanted this to be a first time experience. I wanted this to be a magical first time secret discovery, so to speak. If I put an older character, an old, like an old guy with a, or a 30 year old guy with long hair and a walking stick and a backpack, I would be suggesting that this is, he's an adventurer. This is something he sees all the time. It's nothing new. But by putting a little girl, I'm immediately suggesting that this is a new time discovery. What my audience is going to do in essence, is identify with the character and then identify the environment through the eyes of my character. And that's exactly what I wanted to establish. So my daughter actually wrote down what the moral of the story is. She said, um, the moral of the story is that her, uh, the girls are always right and I'm always wrong because they're perfect and I'm a big poo-poo head. What does that even mean? Anyways, whatever.
All right, now that we're starting to round the end of this painting, um, one of the last touches I wanted to throw in here was water, or the suggestion of it at least. Uh, and water can be a little bit tricky because there's many things to take into account. However, a simple way of looking at, at water is to realize that essentially water is a reflective surface and the color of water and how it reacts is, is a result of what's underneath. Water is not blue, for instance. Water is, is the reason we see water as being blue is because uh, it's reflecting the sky, right? But if, the, if what's under the water is dark earth, it might make that blue a little bit darker and redder because of that, okay? So what we have here is I'm just going to take you quick step by step just to briefly show you how, how I approached it. We need the water surface, and how do we suggest the water surface? With a reflection. So what do I do? I copy this layer, okay? I copy my tree layer, for instance, by holding Alt, and I can click and drag down, or I can click and drag up, depending. But by doing that, I'm automatically duplicating, duplicating the layer. From there, I do a Edit, Transform, Flip Vertical, to flip it upside down, as such, okay? Now you're starting to see where we're going with this. From there, I just lower the opacity of it, like that, so it looks a little bit more like a reflection. From there, I took the smudge tool. Can I find it? Yeah. Smudge tool is right here. It's blur, sharpen, or smudge. So I take the smudge tool. Oops. The smudge tool. I have it set to airbrush. I can have a hard edge or a smooth edge, whatever I want. The strength is set to 80% about. And here, I can smudge it left and right. There's always a little bit of lag with this brush because it's a demanding, it's a demanding feature. And here I can suggest that there's actually uh, ripples, right? It's being pushed around a little bit. Now we're starting to feel that there's a little bit of a, uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, uh, a water effect going on, right? From that point, after what that, we want our lighting on top of it, right? the light that's hitting the surface of the water. So I picked up a color that represented the color of my sunset that was gently grazing over. I have my brush set to soft. I went with a very soft brush, like 40% opacity, 20% flow. Very large brush. Okay. And I'm just holding down shift, I can do a nice straight line going right across. So it's suggesting where that lighting's going to hit, the lighting that's hitting over there. Now, the lighting's hitting the water, but it's also casting a shadow. This branch is casting a shadow. So what was the quickest way to, to, to solve that problem? Let's get my branch. I select it by holding Alt and clicking on it, creating a new layer, and then just doing a fill. Okay, so just black, which is fine. Okay, so I've just created a new layer. If we look underneath, I've just filled it in black. So I can deselect, Control D to deselect, then edit, transform and flip vertical again. Now I'm flipping this one upside down. Now this is the shadow cast by the log, right? It's not uh, the reflection, so it's not going to go straight down. So what I do is I did a control T and then if I hold down control I can shift this over and then I can let go of control and I can just drag it so it lines up properly. I can even move the pivot point here so it doesn't so that point stays in place. And then by continuing to hold control, I can grab one of the corners and start stretching it out like that. Maybe I can move this corner in slightly so it fits nicely. And then I hit enter when I'm happy. And from there, I just do a control, click on the window. And then if I hide this, if we look at our actual lighting layer, I can just do a race. And I've created this effect of shadow. Again. I can take that same smudge tool and I can start respecting the same ripples that I did. It's going to take a little while here. Give it a second. The ripples that I have here, I can mimic that same direction, right? Like that. I can go like this because it goes in this direction. very gently. I've created ripples in the water. And the last magic step to this is, well, I can add another layer that's set to normal, and I can go on my brush tool, and it's like that high value, high value uh, 
thingamabobber, uh, color, yeah, there we go. And I can paint in some light highlights, and I get soft eraser as well. Just where the, the waves catch the light a little bit, maybe a little bit here as well. It's quite simple when it's just a quick Photoshop is a creative tool. I mean, this is just something I figured out because I'm comfortable, I'm familiar with it, so I could figure it out on my own. And here I can come up with my own ideas for doing water in a way that works, just from understanding the tool. And the last little detail that I threw in, once that was all done, was under all of this nonsense, oops, uh, there you go, under all that nonsense, I painted a fish. And that fish was painted under the reflections, right? Just like that. Lower the value of it. Even though it's a fish that's underwater, the light's going to travel through the water. It's going to catch light on them, right? I have to. That's got to be believable. And I found that it really added a nice effect when I had it half under the light, half in front of it. And there you go. We've created a nice water effect, and it took us six minutes. Okay, so that's it. So let's keep watching the painting process.